Astra is going to talk for us. I was just doing a bit of background reading up before today to give a short introduction and then I'll hand over to Ed, sir. I think he'll talk for about half an hour or so and then there'll be plenty of time for questions and discussion. Um, so Ed's arrived with us in 2013 as a postdoctoral research fellow. Uh, very happy to say that he stayed ever since and made a brilliant career um, as an academic with us and builds up a strong lab of, of people working with him, many of whom will feature today probably and are in the conversation, so that's great. Um, and as he'll explain, his research is about the evolutionary ecology of host parasite relationships, really focusing on bacteria. Uh, and the immunity. And this can seem as though it's not relevant to people, but of course, it's highly relevant to absolutely all of us because we can learn so much from this immune uh, function in bacteria that transports right through a much more complex ecology of the world today. Um, from my point of view, it's also really important to talk about the small things in life because we've spent the last hundred years or so trying to kill most of these organisms that cause us trouble. And that has built up no end of complications for us, uh, not least in terms of our own human health. So there's a tendency to think that the small is not important. But in this case, I think Ed's is going to tell us that the small is absolutely critical to the future of the planet and everybody in it um, and all organisms in it. Um, just before I hand over to him, I noticed that in 2016, he was awarded the Heineken Young Scientist Award. And if any of you are old enough, you'll remember the Heineken advert was all about refreshing the parts uh, uh, that other beers don't refresh. And I was thinking that very much Ed's work is refreshing the parts of our knowledge system that other academics haven't been reaching. He's done it incredibly successfully, uh, very collaboratively and built a team of great scientists around him. So um, a brilliant role model for everything we stand for in terms of good science uh, and good scholarship in the ESI. So really pleased that Ed's is going to do this talk um, and I'll hand over to him. Thank you very much, Jane, for this uh, very kind introduction. So thanks for inviting me to give, the, to give this talk today. Um, it's, it's really nice to share, you know, the research that we do with our colleagues here within the ESI as well as other people who are listening in today. Um, so I'm a microbiologist. We study the interactions between bacteria and their viruses. And I don't think I need to explain to anyone these days why viruses are important. But when we say that, we now think obviously about coronaviruses, human viruses. Uh, but then these bacterial viruses, they are incredibly abundant and important, as Jane already mentioned in the introduction. So I want to say a few things about that. And really in a sort of very general way and you know bring in some examples from the research that we do in my lab uh, to provide you with some ideas of the kind of things that we are trying to do but also providing a, a somewhat broader overview so here we see a bacterial cell in green and in yellow we see lots of bacterial viruses that attach to the surface and they will inject their dna into this bacterium and generate new viral particles, eventually lysing the bacterium and releasing these new viral particles. And this is an incredibly common process. So if uh, people look in various environments and start to quantify, try to quantify the abundance of these, um, of these viruses, they find that they're incredibly abundant. <laughs> In soil, for example, it can range from about a thousand to 10 to the power nine um, base particles per gram of soil. And in water, it's a little bit less variable, but anywhere from 100,000 to 10 million phases per milliliter of water. So hugely abundant. And this sort of started to become clear in the late 80s. Um, and it, it really changed the way people were thinking about what controls bacterial densities in, uh, in, in, um, in water, in the ocean. Um, and initially it was thought that grazing would be an incredibly important factor in that. But then when these numbers became clear, even though they're super rough estimates, you know, that thinking started to change and it became clear that phases really sit right at the heart of, of that process. And that's really nicely illustrated in this 
figure from a research of uh, of, um, of a review from Maya Breitbart's uh, group. And here in this in this figure, she um, she puts the the viruses here at the center of this particular cycle here. And these viruses, they are so important um, in controlling bacterial densities, but also in keeping this cycle going because lysis by these viruses will free up carbon, organic carbon that has been fixed and generate this dissolved organic material that can then be used by bacteria to grow again um, and basically keep that cycle going. Um, whereas grazing, for example, can feed into these higher trophic levels through consumption by higher organisms. Um, so uh, yeah, very important for these uh, biogeochemical cycles in many different ways, and this is just one example of that. And how do people get to these numbers of you know a uh, hundred thousand or a million or ten million um, you know viral particles per milliliter or whatever? Uh, it's it's actually very sort of old-fashioned microscopy that people used to make these sorts of estimates. So here we see a picture from a very recent publication um, where people quantify viral-like particles in natural environments. And basically what they do is that they add some sort of stain to a sample and carry out various filtration steps to be sure that we're looking at the right sized particles and then quantifying them under the microscope. Um, and that gives you know, a rough idea of how many viruses can be found in certain environments. And then you know, people observe there's lots of, lots of variation between different environments and so on. Then of course, there's a lot more that one can do. For example, in this next slide, we see some very nice electron microscopy uh, images of viruses and you know, further characterization of how they are um, structured at the molecular level, but also what sort of uh, genetic material they carry. So there's some single-stranded DNA viruses shown here at the top um, with different structures. They can look like this, or they can have these really, uh, you know, long filamentous structures. Um, and these inoviridae, they turn out to be very, very common in lots of different environments as well. And they have a very unique lifestyle. But then it's these double-stranded DNA viruses that are perhaps best known and best studied because um, uh, of the ways that we isolate fates is probably really biased towards these types of, of fates. And we know quite a lot about them, many different structures again. Um, and then there are RNA viruses as well. But because of the way that we enrich and study these viruses, we probably uh, know relatively little of those. And more recently, the, the field has really shifted from these types of, you know, lab-based um, uh, and culture-based technologies towards sequence-based technologies. As sequencing has become more and more common, people have developed, um, you know, increasingly sophisticated pipelines to pull out viral sequences, identify DNA sequences as being viral and classifying um, uh, you know, viruses on that basis. And, and, you know, studies like that have really tremendously increased our knowledge of the viral diversity. And just as an example, a few years ago, there, was a, there were two back-to-back -back big studies that described viral diversity based on sequence data alone, and that yielded a tenfold increase in our knowledge of viruses, basically, the existence of viruses. And this continues to, to grow as our methods to identify viral sequences is, um, is shaping up. Um, and you know, it's, it's really the case that, we, that we've only discovered the tip of the iceberg if it comes to, um, to our understanding of, of these bacterial viruses. So they were incredibly abundant, the most abundant biological entities on the planet. That's what people tend to, um, you know, to, to start their papers with. Um, in fact, they're so abundant, it's about 10 to the power 31 viral particles on this planet, bacteriophages I'm talking about. And I read somewhere today when I was preparing for this lecture that apparently if you would line them all up, you could go a trillion times from here to Mars and back again. Um, technically very challenging, but uh, it can be done. All right. So. 
these viruses, they are diverse in sequence, hugely diverse in sequence, diverse in structure, as I just showed you, diverse in their genetic material. Uh, but what they share is that they have, you know, a limited number of life cycles that they can engage in and, you know, ways in which they can exploit their host. Um, so it's shown here in this review that Anne Chevalier Rowe wrote, uh, so she's a former postdoc in my lab and she now has a position at CNRS in France. Um, and she shows in this figure the three main life cycles that these phases can engage in. So there's these filamentous phases that I was talking about a second ago that form these filaments, that's where they get the name from, uh, and they can infect and either produce viral particles that are being released from a bacterial cell but with no lysis so the cell is surviving this but it's just budding out viral particles all the time very much like we are releasing viral particles um, in with many diseases without necessarily cell lysis being part of that depending on the virus um, so that's what these filamentous phases do then there is lytic phases that can only inject the viral genome, generate new viral particles, lyse the cell in order to release these viruses into the environment. And these viruses then have to find new bacterial hosts to infect. And then there is these lysogenic phases that can in fact integrate their own genome into that of the host and sit silent and basically copy their own genome along with that of the host. And this is also a very, very common strategy. And then once every while, these viruses will induce and enter this lytic cycle and they will find new hosts and then perhaps engage for a couple of cycles in this lytic cycle and then return to lysogeny and again sit silent until the right moment comes to excise again and become induced. And I'll be talking a little bit about that switch because it's very fascinating uh, sort of choice that the virus needs to make. It just has to make the right decision at the right time. It's something we're very interested in. All right, and these, um, this is another review that was that came out a couple of uh, months ago. And uh, I think what, what is nice here is that it shows that this idea of three separate um, uh, life cycles, which is sort of the classical view, uh, can be nuanced a bit further and it can be depicted as is here, more as a continuum where some viruses invest very heavily in this sort of efficient lytic behavior and others, you know, sit at the other extreme. But in between, we've got many different variants that do something that is a bit mixed and sits, um, you know, within those uh, those two extremes. All right. So what I want to talk about first a bit is temperate phases. They are very, very common. As I said earlier, they tend to integrate their own genome into that of the host. And about 50% of sequenced bacterial genomes carry these kinds of viral sequences of temperate phage. And as I will show you over the next couple of slides, these viruses can have a very, very important impact on the behavior of the host that they have infected. First of all, they can excise every now and again. And these viruses that are being released, they cannot infect cells that still carry the virus. This is something that is called super infection exclusion, where cells that carry the phage already are immune to super infection. But imagine a situation where this bacterium is coexisting with another strain of the same species then very often these viruses can be a very powerful tool to kill the competitor. And this is something that is observed quite a lot. And for example, Pseudomonas erysinosa, which is a very important human pathogen uh, that very often colonizes the lungs of cystic fibrosis patients, tends to carry many of these prophases. And um, our colleagues in Liverpool, they studied this Liverpool epidemic strain or the less strain and it turns out that this strain is incredibly competitive. It very often takes over the um, 
the, the lung microbiome in these patients. And it's very good in kicking out resident um, uh, strains of the same species. And one reason that it's so competitive is that it carries five of these prophases that excise and kill competitors incredibly efficiently. And that has made this strain uh, the dominant strain in Liverpool and, you know, one of the important strains in the UK and perhaps even internationally. Then there's many other reasons why these temperate phases can also be important, not just because they kill competitors, but also because they change the phenotypes of the bacteria that they are infecting. I just want to talk you through a couple of examples from this review um, by the group of Joss Whites that came, that was published in Nature Reviews Microbiology earlier this year. So one very, um, well, important phenotype that these phases can have is that they can produce toxins. And these toxins, they can, for example, be released when bacteria are lysed by the phage. So if we have a big bacterial population that carries this phage, some individuals within that population will be lysed. Many of them won't, and that's why the population as a whole is thriving. But these few individuals that are lysed, they can then release these toxins, and that can help the remainder of the population to invade a host. So this top example would, for example, be that of, um, of Shiga toxin that is released by a phage that um, uh, is carried by some E. coli isolates. And you may remember that in 2011, there was an outbreak in Germany that ultimately was linked to um, a biological farm uh, that produced um, some sprouts and, and lots of people who ate this, they became severely ill and 53 of them died. Um, and this this toxin is uh, is a key component of that sort of host colonization by these uh, pathogenic E. coli. Another very good example is that of uh, Vibrio cholera, where the um, CTX toxin, which is the toxin that is basically that makes Vibrio cholera uh, virulent, is encoded by a phage. But in this case, the toxin is made and released without lysis. So here at the top, we have the example where the cell needs to be lysed. Here at the bottom, the toxin is continuously released by the entire population through this bacterial, bacterial secretion system. So toxin production obviously is incredibly important. Um, you know, we think about our own health and disease in this context. Another reason why these phases can be important is because they can sometimes carry genes that manipulate the host immune system. So there's three examples here that I want to talk you through. The top left example here is that of a phage that infects a bacterium, and this bacterium can colonize a sponge. And this is a, um, uh, a symbiont. Uh, this is not a pathogenic interaction, but the phage is required in order to suppress the host immune system in order for this bacterium to colonize. Here at the bottom left, we see the example of Staphylococcus aureus, a very important human pathogen, where a prophage is altering the cell surface, and that enables this pathogen to escape the human immune system. And here at the right, it's a fascinating example that was discovered very recently. This is caused by one of these filamentous phages uh, that I was talking about earlier. And this filamentous phage triggers an immune response in the host against viruses. And that suppresses an immune response against bacteria because these immune pathways, um, they, they have that effect on each other, basically. That is the level of crosstalk between them. So the viral immune response will suppress the bacterial immune response. And that then enables this bacterium that carries the phage, which is Pseudomonas aeruginosa again, to colonize the host successfully. And again, these filamentous phages called PF, they tend to be incredibly common in Pseudomonas 
And then, so we so far, these examples are all about a phage that is, you know, present in a bacterium that then impacts the host. And this is an even more complicated um, um, interaction where there's an additional um, uh, trophic level involved. So here we've got an example that some of you will be familiar with, uh, which is the interaction between an aphid and a parasitoid wasp. And this um, aphid can be protected from parasitism by this parasitic wasp by carrying a bacterium, and this bacterium is called Hamiltonella defensa. It turns out that the protective effects of this bacterium can be traced back to a phage within this uh, bacterial genome. And this phage encodes a toxin that basically suppresses the development of the uh, wasp larvae within the aphid. So here we see the experiment that was published in, in Science. Um, basically here on the left, we have an aphid uh, that is being parasitized very successfully. Then when uh, the aphid carries the bacterium Hamiltonella, that also carries the prophage. There is no longer um, uh, very much parasitism happening because of the protective effect, but that is then lost if this phage is being removed from the bacterial genome. So a really nice example, and just showing how important um, you know, phenotypes these phages can have and how that can shape the interactions between different organisms. Okay, so it's, it's quite understandable why these phages would encode traits that are beneficial to the host if they are being transmitted vertically along with the bacterium, because in that case, the fitness of these phages is very much dependent on the fitness of the host. Of course, that changes when the phage starts to lyse the bacterium and transmit horizontally. And that sort of tension, I think, is, is really interesting. And in general, this sort of switching from uh, lytic to lysogenic replication is incredibly interesting. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have thought about this sort of dual uh, infection mode by these phases and when that should provide an advantage. And this is also nicely summarized in this recent review that I already referred to earlier, where um, Joss Weitz basically explains how the density of susceptible bacteria in a population should have a very big impact on which infection strategy a phage should use. If there are many, many bacteria that are susceptible in a population, then it makes sense for the, for the virus, for the phage, to lyse the bacteria and to infect new bacteria within the population and repeat that cycle over and over again. And it's a very, very efficient way for the virus to amplify. However, if there are very few bacteria in the, uh, in the population, then it's better to instead cause these latent infections and copy along with bacteria every time the bacteria replicates, the phage will replicate its own genome as well. So we see that the, um, the R numbers for horizontal and vertical transmission show opposite trends with um, differences in the density of the susceptible cell population. So that all makes sense. Um, and what's interesting is that the densities of susceptible bacteria will change very, very, very quickly normally as a consequence of the viruses killing bacteria. So th these are not constant. Imagine a situation where we start off with a very dense susceptible population and throw in a virus that will amplify, then very soon that whole bacterial population will collapse and suddenly the virus needs to adjust its replication behavior where first it was the best strategy to go into this lytic cycle that may have changed and now it may be better for the phage to uh, enter into vertical transmission so to become a lysogen and it turns out and this is really fascinating that some viruses use molecular communication in order to regulate that so these viruses they produce a communication signal shown here in yellow and the concentration of that signal will increase as this virus is replicating um, and lysing cells. So we start off with a very 
dense susceptible population but as the virus is replicating on that bacterial population the signal will start to build up and the phage can, can sense this signal and by sensing the concentration of this signal it gets information about the availability of hosts and it can switch its infection strategy accordingly so this phage initially will enter into the lytic cycle and then as the concentration builds up it will switch and it will enter into this lysogenic um, cycle instead and we thought this is just a fantastic example of, of what is the first ever example really of, of viral communication and to use communication to coordinate such a complex um, you know uh, life history strategy I think is fascinating and you know similar um, mechanisms may be at play with higher viruses as well maybe those that affect humans or insects we don't know uh, but we became very interested in this and we set up a collaboration with a couple of different labs including the lab that discovered this system um, and here within ESR with Angus Buckling and then in, uh, in France with Sylvain Gandon who is a theoretician and um, we were very fortunate that John Bruce uh, joined my lab as a postdoc and he let this work that showed that this communication system is not only used to make the transition from this lytic replication towards lysogeny, but also in the opposite direction. And that is shown in this sort of sum summary figure here on the right. Um, so this is what we already knew, a virus will infect and lies and produce signal that is sensed and then the fates will enter into lysogeny. But it turns out that when there is an influx of susceptible hosts, then this signal gets degraded very efficiently and the phage again senses this and it knows now that there are susceptible hosts again in the population and so it will reverse its decision that it made earlier and start to induce again um, and this uh, was also supported by theoretical modeling that Sylvain did uh, as part of this project and we also um, came to both theoretical and empirical um, you know conclusion that the thresholds where the phages are responding to, to signals, so the signal concentrations that cause the virus to switch from one strategy to the other should be quite far apart. So the virus should only respond to uh, a decline in signal when signals become really, really low, and they should only respond in this part of the cycle to changes in signal when the signal becomes really, really high. And, you know, that made sense to us and soon that will all be available uh, for you to read as well. Uh, but it's um, it's a really interesting, um, you know, observa observation, I think, fascinating that viruses can communicate to to make these decisions. All right. So, um, you know, apart from um, um, I, I just spoke about the, the sort of the, the virus side of things, what viruses can do and how they change potentially the host phenotypes and you know depending on what viruses do the the fates can be beneficial to the host but very often it will also be detrimental to the host for example if we look at this agar plate here at the top right where we carried out an infection experiment of sensitive bacteria we see lots of lysis going on so this is where these phases are moving through this lytic cycle they're killing the host and that forms lots of plaques so we see that this really limits bacterial survival on these plates and then of course bacteria can do something about this i mean they can't go into lockdown like we do and you know but they, they also don't have to just suffer the consequences they can instead evolve resistance to phages very quickly uh, and that's what we see happen you know th that is what happens quite a lot when we run um you know infection experiments in the lab we observe that bacteria obtain resistance one way or another uh, and in this case it's CRISPR immunity that they use to become resistant to this page uh, and I will be talking a bit more about CRISPR immunity in a bit because it's something that the, the people in my lab have been uh, you know studying in a lot of detail um, but first I just want to give you a bit more of a general sense about bacterial defenses uh, and there's many of them and this is really a very fast moving area of research where people very recently discovered and you don't need to look at the details here but very recently people discovered that bacteria contain not you know 
not just a few defense mechanisms that we already knew, but they contain dozens and dozens of different systems. And many of them, we have no idea exactly how they work. Okay, so CRISPR-Cas is shown here in the middle. Uh, there are chemical defenses and there are many, many innate defenses that uh, recognize viruses as being foreign uh, based on uh, chemical modifications of um, their own DNA or chemical modifications of the fades DNA and it tells them something's wrong here, this DNA is not my own and they start to cleave it. And then there are abortive infection systems that are very similar to apoptosis in humans where basically uh, individual cells kill themselves when they are infected in order to um, to save the population or the organism in our in our own case. Um, and, you know, uh, people have developed biomedics pipelines to identify these systems, including unknown systems through very smart sort of um, association studies. And it, there are literally many, many dozens of candidate systems that still await to be, you know, characterized. And, you know, we became interested in this uh, oh, yeah, this is another point I wanted to make. What's super interesting is that a lot of these defenses, it turns out, share um, ancestry with defenses that we find in higher organisms. Uh, so prokaryotic organauts is, is one system that we work on as well. Um, Viprins are also found in eukaryotes. Um, and there's there's many, many more. And, um, and this is the, the, the four systems that we were aware of when we wrote this review. And we um, we had a conference just a few weeks ago where people were, um, you know, updating us on the latest discoveries, you know, stuff that hasn't been published yet. And there's many more to come. Uh, so very interesting, um, you know, conservation of function of very ancient defense systems that have obviously diverged in, 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 in some ways, but we can still tell that they originate from the same genes. Um, Okay, so we came across a new defense system by chance. Uh, Alice Maestri, a PhD student in my lab, she carried out infection experiments with a clinical isolate of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. I already told you a bit about this bacterium. It's really a very nasty um, uh, pathogen. <clears throat> and she observed that the fates that we very often use could adsorb to the cell, it could inject its genome, but it would almost never lyse the cell. So something was going on. And um, the strategy that Alice used to then figure out what was what was blocking the phage was that first of all, first of all, she made a, a transposal mutant library. This is a very common technology that microbiologists very often use. Basically what we do is we take, you know, um, billions of cells and each individual cell will obtain a, a transposon that will just integrate somewhere at random in the genome and therefore knock out the function of whatever gene it is that happens to be hit. And she then used this library, as we call that, um, to infect with a phage. And she carried out this, um, this experiment with a phage that carries an antibiotic resistance gene. So she carried out the infection experiment and then she plated the cells onto selective media so that only the cells will grow that carry this antibiotic resistance gene. And these uh, cells therefore carry the phage genome in their own genome. So this is a tempered phage. Um, and they will also carry a mutation in whatever the gene is that normally blocks this infection in the first place. So this is sort of a, a screening method that is, uh, is relatively common. And it revealed that there are eight genes um, that perform some sort of defense function. And some of those genes we recognize from other defense systems and other genes we have no idea what they're doing. So this is really the, the start of a completely new project. It's very exciting. Um, and it, it means we now need to uh, do some biochemistry to figure out, you know, what these different uh, gene products are doing, how they are working together. Do we have some sort of mega complex here with many different proteins involved? Uh, do they act at different stages? We, we have no idea, but this is basically the project that Alice developed um, and um, something we will continue to work on in the foreseeable future.
All right. So what if bacteria don't have resistance to start with? In this case that Alice studied, the bacteria were already resistant. They had innate immunity, but very often uh, bacteria will not have innate immunity and then they can either very quickly mutate the cell surface, which is shown here, um, and then the phage can no longer interact, although the phage can perhaps evolve to overcome um, this mutation. This is something that Angus's lab, for example, has studied in a lot of detail. Um, an alternative mechanism is what we have studied extensively over the last couple of years is the use of CRISPR-Cas immune systems. So CRISPR-Cas immune systems are the only adaptive immune system of bacteria. So it's a system that really um, uh, very similar to you know, our own sort of vaccination programs enables bacteria to obtain a memory of previ previous infections and then to use that memory in order to detect and destroy the same virus when it infects again. The way it works is that this immune system will capture a small piece of DNA from the virus and store it into a database that carries on its genome. And then it will use that memory um, to, uh, to direct an immune complex towards the phage genome when this is present inside the cell. So this is a nice cartoon that shows how it works. Here we see these immune complexes in red and the memory sequence is basically an RNA molecule uh, that is a transcript of this database that is located on the bacterial genome. And one question that we became interested in recently is how this immune system deals with this sort of dual lifestyle of some of those viruses. As I said earlier, these viruses, they may enter into the lytic cycle, but many viruses can also enter into lysogeny. And how does this immune system react to a virus when it can sort of um, switch between these um, exploitative and more benign lifestyles? When the um, virus is locked in the lytic cycle, which is shown here in blue, we found that this immune system provides a huge benefit to the bacteria. But when we have the, the, um, the scenario where the virus can switch between the two, we found that actually the uh, immune system was selected against. So it, it became very toxic for the bacterium to carry this immune system. And it turned out that this was due to autoimmunity issues. So during this cycle, it's totally fine for the bacteria to carry the immune system. But once the phage enters into lysogeny, the bacterial immune system will recognize the phage, it will cleave it, but now the phage is part of its own genome. And therefore, this is incredibly toxic to the bacteria. And CRISPR-Cas is very strongly selected against those conditions. <clears throat> and this helped us to explain why only about 40% of bacteria carry CRISPR-Cas in the first place. Most bacteria do not carry CRISPR-Cas systems, and, and this is probably why. So in the lytic cycle, the benefit of a CRISPR immune system is that it can very quickly uh, acquire immunity against these viruses. It can also very quickly get rid of all these viruses uh, through cleaving their genomes, and ultimately that will lead, lead to phase extinction. Uh, but if we have this sort of dual lifestyle, we see that CRISPR-Cas systems are lost. So we get very quickly mutants arising in the population that will invade. And, um, and that's basically what we end up with. So bacteria kick out their CRISPR-Cas immune systems. All right, so now finally, I want to say a few things still about lytic phage. So there are these phages here, I've already said quite a few things about these uh, temperate phases that can switch between lysogenic and lytic cycles. And I've also said a few things about these chronic phases that can also um, transmit both horizontally and vertically. Uh, but lytic phases, um, I haven't really said much about yet. Uh, so these are phases that can only lyse bacteria. They cannot ever uh, you know, enter into this sort of lysogenic state. Although, as I pointed out earlier, there are some uh, more nuances that have been added recently where these lytic phases can enter into something that's called pseudo-lysogeny. Uh, 
that's not something I want to talk about today. But these lytic phases, they're very interesting um, as a potential tool to kill bacteria and to act as an alternative to conventional antibiotics. We know that we're facing an antibiotic resistance crisis and we need alternative methods to deal with infections by bacterial pathogens. And so a question that we also became interested in is um, where the phases can potentially offer a solution. So this is something that a lot of people are working on. Uh, can we apply phage to treat patients? And um, one question uh, and one scenario that Tachana has explored in the last few years is whether um, they can be used in combination. So would it be the case that if we apply both antibiotics and phage, that they outperform um, you know, the efficacy of either of those on their own? So here we see the bacterial growth uh, in the absence of phage. So we see the bacteria grow really well. They reach very high densities. If we apply phage, we see that the densities are much lower until the bacterial population recovers uh, because of phage resistance evolution. Okay, so initially they're sensitive and therefore the phage is very effective. Once the bacteria become phage resistant, the densities of the bacterial population will become higher again. So this is phage on their own. And then the question was, would we uh, get synergistic effects if we would add, um, if we would add uh, antibiotics in combination with the phage? And in this particular example, which is carbonicillin, Tatiana saw that indeed the bacterial densities are suppressed even more when both are added compared to either one on their own. So here in blue, we see carbonicillin on its own. And this is still the same controls that I showed you earlier. But there were also examples, sorry, um, where Tatiana observed antagonism, where the combination of chloramphenicol in this case and phage was suppressing bacterial densities less effective compared to either one alone. And then screening a larger number of antibiotics showed that this was very often the case. Actually, these ones here in green all show antagonism between antibiotics and phage. So combination therapy may not be very effective, at least in the short term. Whereas with uh, carbonicillin and ciprofloxacin, she saw that there was synergy in particular with carbonicillin. And then in terms of phage resistance evolution, Tachan also made a very striking observation that actually the addition of antibiotics can completely change the type of resistance that bacteria evolve. So I told you earlier that bacteria can evolve CRISPR-Cas immunity, but they can also change their cell surface, which is abbreviated as SM. And she found that with some antibiotics, bacteria suddenly start to evolve much, much higher levels of CRISPR-Cas immunity relative to the surface modification uh, option that they have. And this was observed to be the case whenever the, the, the antibiotics had a bacteriostatic action, which basically means that they slow down bacterial growth rather than killing the bacteria. And the reason behind it is really um, that a bacteriostatic antibiotic slows down the infection as well. And that provides more time for an adaptive immune system to do its thing. If we think about highly virulent viruses, you know, think of Ebola, then our own immune system may also become overwhelmed. Uh, and more slowly uh, replicating viruses are easier to catch for an immune system. And that's basically what this work shows. And that sort of links in with uh, our previous observation that um, um, not just you know, antibiotics, but more generally the environment that bacteria thrive in can shape the type of defense mechanisms and strategies that bacteria employ. So in this case, CRISPR immunity is shown in green. And what Eleanor, a PhD student in my lab showed is that if Pseudomonas erysinosa is co-cultured with additional opportunistic human pathogens, that Pseudomonas erysinosa will adjust its defense strategy against phage and CRISPR-Cas becomes a lot more important under those conditions. 
And this really places, um, you know, that sort of experimental evolution of phage resistance into a microbial community context. And it shows that the microbiome is really important in determining what the eventual outcome is going to be. And we cannot just infer that from, um, you know, a pairwise interaction study in a test tube. You really have to take the microbiome into account. And this has important knock-on consequences for the severity of disease, as Eleanor demonstrated with um, infection experiments in wax moth larvae, um, which are very you know, simple infection models that people commonly use because they're very easy to work with and uh, easy to obtain. And what Eleanor did is that she injected these bacterial clones that had evolved CRISPR immunity or that had evolved surface-based resistance she injected those into the larvae, and then she measured how long it took for the bacteria to kill the larvae. And they will, because this is an opportunistic pathogen that will eventually kill the larvae. And she found that bacteria that are fate sensitive and those that are CRISPR immune, they killed the larvae after about 36 hours and a bit. Uh, but those that evolved surface mutation, they became less virulent. It takes significantly longer for these um, bacterial clones to kill the larvae. So they become less virulent, but bacteria that evolve CRISPR immunity, they, they remain equally virulent. And this virulence trade-off that is associated with surface-based resistance is something that is uh, very, very frequently observed in many different bacterial pathogens. And it's also something that people are on purpose exploiting when they think about phase therapy. It's not just about killing bacteria, but it's also about if bacteria evolve resistance, let's make sure they do it in a way that they can no longer cause disease. So it's a, it's a very uh, sort of um, nice two-edged uh, sword that people are trying to apply, but CRISPR systems, they can really put a spanner in the wheels of that particular strategy by enabling bacteria to, to retain their virulence. Okay, so then finally, um, what can viruses do if bacteria have CRISPR-Cas immune systems. We published a study in 2018 which shows that um, viruses can encode anti-CRISPR uh, genes. This was already known. Um, and that viruses that do, um, they, they are facing a bit of a challenge because if these viruses infect a cell that has CRISPR immunity, then it really becomes a race against the clock. The virus is injecting its genome and it still needs to produce the anti-CRISPR proteins. But the CRISPR-Cas immune system is there, it's ready. And the virus is, is coming in and these immune complexes, they will recognize this genome probably before the proteins have been made and before they will have found the immune complexes and inactivated them. So these little proteins, the anti-CRISPR proteins, they tend to bind to these immune complexes and basically inhibit their function. But that all needs to happen before the immune complexes recognize the viral genome. That doesn't happen. And so what we saw is that these viruses, they actually need to work together. Uh, very often what will happen is that the first virus will inject its genome, produce anti-CRISPR protein. This virus will be destroyed but the bacterium will enter into an immunosuppressed state uh, because the immune complexes are inactivated due to this anti-CRISPR protein that lingers in the cell. And these cells can be exploited by a second phage, um, and that will then lead to a successful burst. And therefore, if these phages are applied, in a, for example, in a clinical context, we need to make sure that we apply them in high densities so that this second step is very likely to take place because ultimately if we apply these viruses in low densities we see that these viruses will simply go extinct because there's not the follow-up secondary infection is lacking so applying high densities can help to um, to deal with that issue all right, it's not the only strategy. Uh, this is uh, a nice example from one of our colleagues from New Zealand, which shows that some viruses, they build a nucleus around their own genome. So they enter into the bacterial cell and straight away, first thing these viruses do is that they build a nucleus. 
And that nucleus protects them from systems like CRISPR-Cas and any of those other additional defense systems that bacteria have. And it's quite a nice analogy where bacteria, um, where, um, uh, sorry, where a lot of um, uh, eukaryotic, um, uh, where eukaryotes built a nucleus in order to protect themselves from, from viruses, um, and now viruses are building their own nucleus in order to protect them from our own immune systems. Um, so that's a, that's a cool story. Um, and these viruses, they, they just keep surprising us with new functionalities and strategies that they have. All right, with that, I just want to, um, to use this a bit outdated um, lab picture when we were in Truro at the brewery. Uh, maybe this is a good moment to also highlight Ann, who is on this big picture on the right in the white jersey. And I noticed I didn't put her picture earlier when I showed a lot of figures from her um, from her review that I used uh, for this uh, for this PowerPoint. Um, I also want to thank collaborators that we work with, um, and of course also funders uh, who have supported this research program. And thank you all for your attention, and I'm very happy to um, to discuss. Great, thank you, Ed. So that was fantastic talk, loads to think about. And I was really struck by how complicated these small organisms and their relationships are. Uh, and lots of people have questions, I'm sure. So maybe you can just store this one up for now. But it does strike me that we, we seem to be very gung-ho about our own immunity. Um, in the way we treat it and think about it. And yet the complexity that you're looking at in terms of relationships between back bacteria and virus highlights how complicated we, these management systems are between self and other. And the, the things about autoimmunity that you were raising with the CRISPR-R CRISPR process really struck home because there are, is such a rise in autoimmunity in the human population, for instance, which is probably related to very similar processes that are going on, of which we are in pretty much, you're not ignorant, but most of the population is, and certainly the medical profession often are. So there's so many important resonances about what's happening to human health, not to mention the rest of the ecosystem. So uh, it's terrifying when actually, but also very exciting. So. I'll shut up and see if anybody's got questions. Either put a hand up or just stick your camera on. And in fact, actually, Ed, so you could stop sharing and then we can see people's faces. Um, who wants to ask a, a question? Did I stop sharing already? No. Not yet. Oh, Stefano. Go for it, Stefano. Hi, um, good afternoon. <clears throat> Terrific presentation. I, I could even understand what was going on. So that, that's, 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 that's a good sign. Um, yeah, of course, being just a so social scientist, um, I, I'm going to ask you um, a more general question uh, based on what's going on around us the last almost two years. Um, I've been often asked recently to take a stand uh, make uh, clear my 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 view uh, about the role of science in society. Um, it seems impossible nowadays to declare that, for example, we know yet still not enough about certain mechanisms or or, or, or processes. Uh, I, I can't even imagine uh, what has happened to you. Uh, have you been asked? to take political stands, uh, for example, around vac vaccination, uh, around the role of science in, 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 in society. Uh, and, and, and what is your, your view about that? Uh, should scientists refrain from, from doing that or, or not? No, no, not at all. I, I, think, I think we should engage. Uh, so I think it's a really important point that you're, uh, you know, that you're raising here. Um, it's also one that you know, to be honest, I find it very hard to to engage um, in the current climate. Um, the reason being that there's so much misinformation and you know lack of respect in in the discussions that are being 
held that it, it becomes quite a depressing you know, undertaking to get mixed up in that discussion. And, you know, to, to be honest, for me, that is perhaps one of the, you know, one of the reasons why I'm not very active, uh, you know, in those discussions. Um, I see them, you know, on, on platforms such as Twitter, um, but it's it's not very appealing to get you know mixed up in 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 the um, in the conversation, um, and you know you hear really horror stories of people who do and who get uh, you know um, uh, tons of shit um, poured over them, you know as a consequence of the uh, things they say that. But but I I do think we should because you know if we, if we don't then where is this discussion heading, you know then who are leading the discussion that's the uh, you know that's the other side of it, so we probably just have to uh, to engage more and um, but also think of yeah ways in which we can um, maybe you know this is this is kind of outside my area of expertise but I imagine that if we want to shape this. Uh, you know the, the the various discussions that are related to science, and we also need to think about um, how we make sure that people take you know science seriously and scientists seriously. I know I, I don't have a very good answer for you, Stefano, but that's my sort of take on um, on where we are in that. Mm. Thank you. I think your talk really highlighted the need for a bit of humility whoever's doing the talking because of the complexity of the system. Um, at least we could start with that and listening to each other and being a bit more humble about what we do or don't know. We've got yeah. two questions though, William Riley and someone called 20 Dodds CE40, <laughs> who's got a real name. So William first. Well, that's very nice of you, Jane. I think um, 20 Dodds was, was somewhat ahead of me, but I, I'll gladly speak up um, and I'm sorry if I do speak some way out of turn as a, a, a somewhat naive undergraduate. Um, but I've done some reading on uh, the potential for, for bacteriophages in therapeutic lines, uh, which to re-emphasise what you pulled out from uh, Professor Edzer's comment, it's something we really do need to engage with before the crisis hits us. That 2050 uh, 10 million death statistic is every year um, and it will come before then as well if antimicrobial resistance is allowed to, um, to grow. Hence Stefano's point of societal engagement and now is the time to not just inform but to, to get the solutions ready. Um, hence the interest in bacteriophages. Um, it, what I found really interesting in my learning from 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 that talk was this: the combination of um, conventional antibiotics with bacteriophages, and that uh, variably uh, agonistic antagonistic effect. I, I've just looked into that same paper, and I couldn't see a reference to the use of phages in combination. Um, I know that's something that the L.A. Arver Institute have been doing for, for years anyway, but putting different phages together. Um, is there any literature which shows a, a particular uh, efficacy against any uh, bacterial strain in, in doing that um, from more recent research? Um, uh, and are there comparable uh, agonistic and antagonistic relationships that we, we, we could draw out? So... You know, there's uh, there's a bunch of studies that look at synergistic and antagonistic interactions between bacteria, uh, bacteriophage and antibiotics. Um, but I, I think systematic studies are lacking at the moment. Um, what I showed you today is unpublished, um, so you won't find this anywhere yet. We are still running experiments to finish things up. And, you know, I, w what we find, at least with the bacterium and the phase that we use, and the specific conditions that we use, and you know, there's a lot of caveats there. It's it's really important to bear that in mind, but that you know, antagonistic interactions, at least in the short term, they tend to dominate. The reason is that when we add phage, they need healthy and dense bacterial populations for them to make an impact. So you may want to, you know, if if, if you want to take that, then again a step further, uh, you know, if you 
add things together, then the antibiotics will suppress bacterial densities and that will make it harder for the phage to do its thing. And so you can explain the antagonistic interaction there. So you may want to start thinking about sequential additions, right? First, phase okay. through thing and then hit them again for the others. Um, yeah, and these are all protocols that if we are coming to therapeutic avenues, we need to be working up from the start, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm very conscious that we're two minutes over time already, which is so sad. And we've got Mr. Twen Mr. or Mrs. 20 Dodds CE40. So over to you. Hi, sorry. Um, I don't know how to change my name and my camera's not working. But do you think that this has any implication into our understanding of like the gut microbiome? Because I know that like viruses are in the gut microbiome. And I'm not sure what you think about that. Yeah. And that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, incredibly complex system, right? So many different bacterial species and viruses. A lot of them are temperate. Um, and, you know, the recent studies have highlighted how viruses in the gut uh, can evolve very quickly to change their host, for example, how hosts can evolve to become CRISPR immune against fate. So all of these things are happening there. Uh, I think what makes it really hard at the moment to to answer your question. I mean, there's a huge knowledge gap there, and you know, it's a the, 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 the question you're asking is, is super relevant, but you know, there's there's not a really good answer to it because these systems are so complex. Very often, what happens is that people will carry out some sort of descriptive study, right? They will um, uh, just describe whatever is there, and um, but they can't really infer any causality because the system is just way beyond whatever you may be able to manipulate. And then at the other extreme, we've got lots of people, you know, running test tube experiments with one bacterium and one phage, and you know, we've learned so many important things from that. But I think now that we're starting to realize that we want to understand how these interactions shape you know uh, the dynamics within microbial communities we have to find some sort of system that we can start to do that and what Eleanor has done in in, in my lab is just one example of um, you know of that where we start to generate a very simple microbial community of about five species and and then already we see a lot of things changing so we're nowhere near <laughs> to the point where I could answer your question with any confidence. But what I can say is that this is a very important area of research. Um, and lots of people are, you know, starting to think in that direction. Thank you. Yeah, and I think your slides were really striking where you show the effect of environment and the fact that what can be an advantage in one env environment then quickly becomes a disadvantage. So there isn't an absolute answer to these things because we, we have to understand them in the context. Um, so the complexities within the system, as well as the relationships between the different organisms. So it's amazing work and it really highlights the importance of this for uh, what we're doing in the ESI, but also the future of humanity. So um, I'm afraid we've run out of time. We're going to have to stop this conversation now, but that doesn't mean we should stop it. We'll have to find ways of carrying it on. And there is the network, obviously, around microbiology at Exeter, where you're doing that. So... Maybe I can just uh, say that, you know, I, I went hugely over time, but if there's anyone who uh, still has questions or wants to have a chat, feel free to drop me an email and I'm always happy to, you know, to have a conversation or to just answer, you know, specific questions that you may have. Great. Thank you, Edsa. And a big round of applause from all of us. It's been a really, really good talk. So thank you very much. And thanks to everybody for coming. We're going to record this. Well, we have recorded it and it'll be on the website um, shortly. So thanks to Amrita for that. Uh, and if I don't see people before the holiday time, hope everyone has a lovely holiday and we'll resume these talks in September. So we're going to have another slot in September. So big thanks to Edza and everybody and see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.